Hey everybody, welcome to another great episode of Scott Talk. Today we have Mr. Joe Bouchard. He's a co-founder of Blue Oyster Cult. And they had several big hits throughout the 70s and 80s. Uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, Astronomy, Hot Rails to Hell, um, Burning for You, Godzilla. Lots of great songs. They had two platinum records and seven actually five gold records uh, seven altogether uh, reaching that at least gold plateau and since then Joe's released six solo records and that's what we are here to talk about so let's welcome Joe in Joe welcome to Scott Talk so glad you could take some time out to be here today I'm a huge fan of yours thanks for being here well thank you it's nice to be here how was Santa to you this year (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, we've been doing a lot of cooking at home. So Santa brought a bunch of nice cooking tools. Ah, (laughs) very nice. (laughs) It used to be I couldn't even crack an egg. I didn't know how to crack an egg. But I'll tell you, I can make a killer omelet now. Wow. Really killer. So that's that's basically, uh, yeah, you know... uh, I I uh, I treated myself with some uh, a new guitar. Ah, that one, that one right back there, and it's a really nice one. So cool. But yeah, yeah, yeah Santa was good. Christmas was good. Having a lot of fun. We had a we had an open mic with my family, and I have five brothers, and we're all musicians, and and um, and uh, our cousins sat in this time. So we had a a big family get together the day after Christmas and everybody had so much fun. We're going to do it again in another month. We're going to have Christmas all year round. (laughs) Fantastic. (laughs) Excuse me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about your, your family because you have five brothers and do you said one sister Mm -hmm. and uh, that's kind of how you got into music was actually um, you grew up in New York. Yes. Um, but it wasn't like New York city. You actually, it was a farm, right? Way up in the North, as far as you can go. If you go any further, you, you'll end up in Canada. (laughs) We're right on, we were right on the Canadian border up there, uh, on the St. Lawrence river part. Uh, and it's called the, the area is called the thousand islands because there are over a thousand islands in this river. And, uh, that's definitely, you know, where I came from and it's still, still a good part of uh, what I think about and dream about is, uh, the thousand islands. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, grew up on a farm up on the side of the river and, uh, we turned the barn into a dance hall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we didn't really like farming much, but, uh, well, we love music. And uh, the barn dances, the barn dances were legendary. And, uh, you know, he just sort of said, you know, I, I want to do this more, you know. I wasn't going to get a straight job. But, uh, you know, you know, so, it, it just kicked it all off. And people liked it. Uh, it was just so much fun, you know. Yeah, so Albert, uh, your your brother Albert, the, the drummer. Yes. Right, co-founder yes. of Blue Oyster Cult. Yes, he, it, he, is he a year or two older than you? I don't remember. Yeah, about one year older. Okay, so he, I, so it was it him that? <clears throat> excuse me again. Sorry, started playing um, drums, and then I, I was reading that you uh, kind of started on what the trumpet and yes. the, was it piano? Yes, yes. And, we had we had a band with two trumpets and a drum. Wow, <laughs> and eventually. We expanded to the upright piano, and uh, uh, luckily, my 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 uncle was a really good guitar player, and he played kind of like, um, you know, Les Paul, the and Les Paul and Mary Ford. He would do those old jazz numbers from the late fifties, wow. early sixties, and um, and he had a bunch of guitars. So, and and eventually he let us use, use them. I I was amazed that, uh, 
he, he uh, let us borrow his equipment. So then we turned into a more of a rock band. We didn't know what we were at first. Right. But as soon as we started uh, strumming the guitars, the girls started coming around, you know? <laughs> right. It was, so it was kind of, it was a, a family kind of thing from the yeah. beginning, really, yeah. with you, because you had yeah. relatives and family members yeah. playing with you in the barn at the yeah. parties. and Yeah. And it was your yeah. dad worked for uh, the local uh, radio station. Yes, was it? radio and TV. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I, uh, he he actually, after we got fairly popular, he got us a gig at the TV station, playing wow. at uh, I think it was like the five o'clock cartoons. Oh wow! <laughs> we played in between the cartoons on the cartoon show called Kitty's Carnival. And uh, it was just happened to be one of those days that was raining. So everybody had to go inside and turn on the TV. And there we were playing at the, between the cartoons at, at this, uh, this local, local cartoon show. Yeah, man, that was, that was a lot of fun. Of course, we were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> your first taste of we, fame though we, are, huh? we, we yeah but it was our first taste of fame and then we went on to things like playing dances for the boy scouts and uh we did every high school in the area and you know uh it was uh it was a uh, it was really good you know we, we this was about the time of Beatlemania. oh and, i see uh, we had started before that we had you know i'm you know, we had started in the pre Beatle days and we did uh, instrumentals by the Ventures and we did Beach Boys songs and, you know, whatever was on the radio. Uh, but when the Beatles came out, it was a, it was just a, you know, it was a, it was a tremendous earthquake of music. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, um, uh, and we would do high school shows with beetle wigs wow because we had short hair but we had the wigs and the girls would scream just like the beetles wow and we're like wow this is fun <laughs> <laughs> it, it was silly but it was it, it really happened it really did happen so you know we uh eventually as most high school bands do you know guy goes off to college and Albert went off to college. So the band broke up. Uh, we had a few other, you know, little, little bands that we played with. Um, and then I went to college and studied music at Ithaca college. Right. Uh, Ithaca is a great, great town for music. Um, I, uh, I played continually through, uh, through my college years. I should have been studying. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been hitting the books. I don't know that how they ever found enough credits for me to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I flunked uh, art history and I flunked uh, well, what else? Philosophy. I don't know. It's, it's like I I just couldn't keep awake in the morning. You know, I was up gigging at night. Well, yeah, but it's, it's but, co it's but college, uh, you know, just yeah. In Ithaca, you had Cornell University there. So it was like Animal House every weekend. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we had an agent. Well, I, one of the bands I had, we had an agent. Mostly it's by word of mouth you get booked in those things. But uh, we had an agent for the last two years I was in college, and I was making good money, you know. So I said to myself, myself, I got to do this. It's just too much fun, you know. And um, as soon as I got out of college, my brother had been in New York for a couple of years and they had started the band called Soft White Underbelly and they got a deal with Electra Records, right? Uh, the famous Electra Records. And uh, in the middle of the summer after I graduated, he calls me up in the middle of the night and says, we need a bass player. And uh, so, um, and then, but the kicker was, he said, our manager, Sandy, is getting us a tour with Led Zeppelin, and we need a bass player. We need we got to have somebody right away. So I says, "Well, as soon as I finish my summer job, 
I'll, I'll come to New York and I'll join the band. I mean, there was no question. And they knew me from my college days. Uh, they would they would come upstate and I'd I'd book them or I during my uh, college breaks I'd go down to Long Island, live at their band house for a week or two, and I'd be jamming with the band. So they they knew me, and um, yeah, it was a really 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 a very smooth transition from their old bass player. Just wasn't working out, so yeah, I was there ready to become a rock star. And Ready. without without any, you know, any trepidation or uh, I never thought for a minute that it wouldn't happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was a pretty naive kid from, you know, a little farm town. And, but, uh, well, Led Zeppelin at the time, um, they weren't like necessarily Led Zeppelin yet. Right. I mean, well, or yeah, were they? they they were. This were is they... post uh, the the new Yardbirds. They were the new Yardbirds. Okay, on their so first tour, but they had their first album out. I remember first album. Okay, all right. Yeah, they had their first album out, and they came to the United States. They did a few uh, sort of gigs where uh, they opened for other people. Actually, I think they opened for Alice Cooper. Hmm. So yeah. I'm see, like that's kind of. That's kind of what I so, mean. Like they weren't like the the yeah, were, hugest yeah. thing in the world, but no, they, they were weren't. Still... No, no, they were just getting their feet wet. Yeah, and uh, but uh, you know, we knew they were going to happen. I right. knew they were going to happen. So, um, but as as it turned out, uh, they never really had an opening act. After, you know, so I got to the band house. I said, "I'm ready for the Zeppelin tour. Let me know." And said, Albert said, uh, it's, it's not happening. And I'm going, oh, my. Uh. And then four days later, we get dropped from Electra Records. And I got really mad then because, like, hey, come on, give me a chance. So I was, wow. I, I was like, really an excited young kid at that time. And um, so we, we worked uh, playing clubs and, you know, doing, you know, uh, uh, demos. We did some demos. Our manager took the demos around to the record labels and nobody liked them. So uh, three, four months after we did some more demos, then we started getting some uh, some uh, interest. We started getting some interest from record labels. And um, we, uh, we did an audition for Clive Davis, who was the head of Columbia Records at that time. And uh, it was my first audition for any record label. And uh, was that they signed us. They decided, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Obviously, <it> right? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how serious we thought it was, but we, we played five songs. We were in the conference room. You know, you see the conference rooms of these big corporations with the big long desk. And well, they moved the desk out. We put all our equipment at one end of the conference room. And then at the other end of the conference room was six chairs, maybe seven, you know, and the executives came in. There's Clive sitting in the middle. And somebody said Patty Smith was there, but I'm not sure about that. But oh, Bobby wow. Columbia and Harry Nielsen was wow. there. Harry Nielsen was at our audition. Wow. And uh, so we just played five songs and as fast as we could. And uh, the next day he said, yeah, Clive wants to sign this. So, so we got signed. Then the real work starts. Uh, we had been rehearsing all summer to, you know, get ready for this. And, uh, you know, playing our songs in clubs, even though the clubs didn't want us to do original material. We mm. would we would slip them in anyway, you know. When when they weren't looking, when they weren't they they wanted us to play cover songs, you know, the local whatever was on the radio. Right. So yeah. um, that hasn't changed. We, yeah, that hasn't changed, right? So uh, we uh, got a deal. It was it was a very nice deal for us, especially as far as uh, uh, artistic control. 
we supplied the artwork we supplied the masters basically they didn't have much to do with this and hopefully knock on wood hopefully it would sell you know or you know and the first record came out we started touring uh did a lot of we toured with alice cooper we opened for uh uriah heap uh we opened for Deep Purple. We opened for Black Sabbath. And uh, slowly, the album started selling more. And so they, they they sold enough of the first album to agree to let us do the second album. And the second album did pretty well, but it wasn't quite the what they expected. The third album was got a lot of critical success. Um, uh, and it sold a, a little bit more, so... The, the fourth album we did was a live album called On Your Feet or On Your Knees. Yeah. And uh, it did really well because we had been, you know, playing in all these arenas, opening for big bands. So people, you know, we wanted to give our fans a souvenir of the great time they had, you know, wherever it was, the Long Beach Arena or... or you know, the, the Felt Forum or wherever wherever it was recorded. It was all recorded all over the United States. Yeah. And that gave us a little more, bit more time to work on uh, what became our biggest record, which was Agents of Fortune. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the problems with new bands is, you know, you have, you know, years to work on your first album. And then you see a little success, and then you have like three months to do your second album. Same thing with the third album, you know. But we did that since we did the live album, it gave us an extra twelve months to work on, you know, uh, Agents of Fortune. Right. And we went to we went to Europe, did a very successful tour of Europe, and uh, and. Uh, with Agents of Fortune came the big hit, Don't Fear the Reaper, which which still eclipses all of our songs, basically. It's it's just it got tremendous uh, longevity. Yeah, I was going to actually bring that up. Uh, what um, I know, was it back in 2000, the Saturday Night Live skit with Will Ferrell and uh, Christopher Walken, you know, I need the more cowbell. You know that that's just so classic, and I bet that when that when that came out, that really kind of bumped up, you know, your sales. Yeah. It kind of brought yeah. you guys, you know, kind of back to life well, a little bit. Well, there bit, was maybe. a whole generation that grew up on hip hop, yeah, and grunge, and who knows, yeah, modern country, whatever there was in in the nineties. The nineties was not that uh, favorable to yeah uh, uh, Blue Oyster Cult. But after the cowbell thing, it started to pick picking up, and now the whole cowbell thing is just out of control. <laughs> it's just out of control. <laughs> it's so it's funny because like, I never even realized that there was any cowbell in that song, and I'm still not even sure if that that actually was it, there a cowbell. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. It sounded like one, but it wasn't very prominent or anything like it, on know. the vinyl, especially the vi the original vinyl record. Okay. It was mixed really low. But just before the Saturday Night Live skit, Columbia remastered it for CD. And they put out, uh, I think it was Best of Blue, uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, Best of Blue Oyster Cult. Right. Uh, a nice uh, compilation. And uh, on that recording, must have been the one that Will Ferrell was listening to <laughs> on his headphones when he said, I hear a cowbell. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and if you open up that, the folder on the CD, you'll see us guys all in our, in our, what, our stage clothes and the costume mistress or the costume master at Saturday Night Live must open that same folder and found the costumes that, that the, the comedians wore during the set, you know. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's legendary, you know, and it's it's kind of true. Uh, my brother, we there's a lot of dispute over who who played the actual cowbell, 
And it was one of those <laughs> things. We got, we did this on 24 track tape. You don't remember those days, but you only had 24 tracks to get everything down. Not like now when you can open up a computer and get a hundred tracks, no problem. Right, right. So we had one track left. Everything else was full and it sounded great. And it was just, you know, the harmonies were great and the guitars were great. And, uh, but there was one track left. So it was the last day of recording and we were all sitting around in the control room saying, well, you know, we got one track. What, what do you want to do? And, and David Lucas, one of our co-producers said, how about we put some percussion on it, you know, and you know, they tried the things. They had bongos, bongos, bongos going. Right. I almost like that, but a lot of other stuff was just way off base. <laughs> and then finally, uh, David says to Albert, Albert, go out there and play a cowbell. Just, just straight, straight <laughs> cowbell. And I'm sitting on the couch in the control room, and I'm saying, oh, don't screw this up. You know, <laughs> it sounds so good, you know. And he went out there, one take, perfect, one try, all the way through, perfect. It was, and the, that was that was the last overdub, and it was all done. You know, it wasn't like uh, for for comedy's sake. <laughs> you know, the, the, you know the cowbell is done at the live recording. Right, right. But, uh, the way it was is we all recorded together on that song, but there was no cowbell at that moment. Like I said, it was a couple of weeks later when we had that one track that we could fill in. So, so yeah, this, it was. So the the song it. wasn't written around the cowbell like no, it is in no. the skit, obviously. No, no. <laughs> uh, Donald came in, uh, Donald, our guitar player, also known as Buck Dharma, you know, he wrote a fabulous song. And I knew that this was going to be a, a, a breakthrough for us. Um, not everybody felt that way, but I was totally thought that this, this song had some, had some magic that we, that we hadn't seen before. And, um, so, you know, and he is a, not only is he one of the greatest lead guitar players in the world and highly underrated, you know, as far as guitarists go, but he's awesome. And he was awesome back when I knew him when I was in college. Uh, a real talent, but he also came up with this this hit, and he actually plays the drums well, and he puts a, uh, when he he does his uh, his demos, he uh, he adds a lot of uh, a real you know a lot, lot of nice production things and percussion. He adds percussion to his demos, so uh, it just happened that that uh, that was the one. That was the one. And it's wow. and it's the gift that keeps on giving, you know, because every Halloween it goes through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the Everybody's, only one. Yeah. That wasn't the only one. Okay. Well, yeah, no, Enough I'm just Yeah. No, I just uh, that wasn't the only song that you know, of yours that kinda got a boost because yeah. Met Metallica, right? Covered yes. uh astronomy on their garage days uh yes. record back in yes. the day when that came out. I don't even know yes. when, but so that was cool, 19, too, for you, right? 97. 97. Garage Inc. was a double album set. Um, I was working. I had left the band, and I was working in a publishing company. I uh, actually learned how to write books. I wrote some uh, instructional books, and I uh, was working in this publishing company, and the Internet was brand new at that time. Uh, and I, I, I noticed on the internet, on the chat board, that Metallica was going to cover a Blue Oyster Cult song. And I thought, oh, you know, they'll pick one of the usuals or whatever. And then I found out it was going to be astronomy. And I was floored. I couldn't believe it. Right. And um, so, uh, yeah, that changed my life. That were, uh, You know, because I had left the band in 86, and uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in music or, but I definitely wanted to try some different things. And I worked as a teacher in a private school for a while. Um, and then I went to this publishing company thing, which was, which is 
an eye opener. It was like a whole world that I had no idea how it works. But um, and then when that song was covered, and they did a great job with it. Yeah, I uh, they sent me a cassette. You know the old cassettes. You know, oh, you, wow! You put them in the cassette player in the car. Yeah. So I went to my post box, and there was this cassette that said Metallica on it. So I plugged it into my car, and like, I couldn't believe it. I just wanted to j- jump up and down, but I was driving down the road. <laughs> <laughs> so you just went faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing it wasn't a Highway Star. I would have had a. Oh. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but they they that was a beautiful set. They uh, uh, they they did a. It was all covers, basically, and uh, you know, M- Motorhead and and Queen is on there, and uh, you know, Thin Lizzy. They covered Thin Lizzy, yeah. so it was kind of a, a package of covers, uh, stuff that they had been playing in shows for years, and uh, I am very grateful. So I thought, like, you know, I got to go back and be a songwriter again. I got to get back in. You know, I mean, this is this is really fortunate that the song that I basically wrote while I was walking on the beach. I wrote this song in my head. We had a we had a beach house on Long Island, and I had been working on the lyrics. I had the the lyrics came from our manager Sandy Perlman, and um, I changed a couple of lines around, so I had it ready, but I didn't know what it was going to be. And then I said, well, I think I'll just go for a walk down the beach, you know. It was was a beautiful day, you know, beautiful sunny day. I'm walking down there and I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. (laughs) thinking all this. I'm thinking this in my mind. So I came back and the band was there to rehearse in the living room of our house. And so we, uh, uh, I said, here, let's try this. And uh, there's a lot of, I don't know if it happened quickly or it was a thing that we had worked on for a couple, I don't know. There's a lot of different, you know, the timeline is kind of fuzzy. Right. As to, you know, how it all came together. But it was out and, uh, you know, it, it was a, a popular song with the fans. The fans just love that song for some yeah. reason. Uh, a tremendous Tremendous performance by Eric Bloom on the vocal. Yeah. Uh, Alan's piano is awesome. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, a beautiful, beautiful track. So, but it never was a single until, you know, uh, it was covered by uh, Metallica. And, yeah. Uh, it's just lucky. And then I started saying, well, I got to get back. And so I, I quit my day job. At the publishing company, you know, okay. making books, typesetting books. I was yeah. a music engraver. Uh, I would, and you know, I, I learned a lot, you know, and I, you know, uh, and I wrote some books and they still sell the books. It's uh, Alfred Publishing sells the books. And, uh, but I went back and, and uh, I hooked up with Ian Hunter. Ian Hunter happened to live in my, neighborhood and i saw him at the magazine store so so after i quit my day job the first guy i called was ian i said ian i got this monday night thing where we get together and write songs would you be interested in coming down to neil smith's house that neil was the drummer and alice cooper right neil dennis dunaway and myself had a little project going I think our our music really needed some help, uh, you know. And I knew that uh, Ian could c- co-write a song. He wrote a song for Blue Oyster called called "Going Through the Motions." Good one. Uh, Eric Bloom sang on his solo album that did very well. And so Ian said, "Yeah, I'll go down." And I went to pick him up, and, and I said, uh, "You bringing your guitar?" He says, "Oh no, I'm just going to observe," you know. I'm not, mm-hmm. You know, he didn't. He was like the kind of guy that doesn't like to have a schedule. Mm-hmm. He just likes to do things that are just sort of random and ha- happen. And he doesn't like to say, "Oh, I've got to do this on Tuesday." You know, no. Gotcha. And uh, so we came down. We had a good time. 
you know, and uh, he he co-wrote four songs with us. So I'm riding in the car with Ian from his house down to Neil's house, and it was about a 40-minute ride, so he would be like giving me a songwriting lesson. Huh. Wow. <laughs> he would be like, well, you know, you do this, and if you if you work on a song and you only get one word in that, then you know, if you're writing lyrics and you only get one word, it takes all day to get that one word, it's worth it. Yeah. You know, and then he would, he would continually harp on me like saying, well, <laughs> you know, because he had worked with a lot of other people. He worked with David Bowie and, you know, Mick Ronson and you know great musicians, right? And and you know he says if you gotta put the time in, you know if you don't put the time in, it isn't gonna come, you know. Yeah. So little words of wisdom, <laughs> and then that sort of started me to where I am today with my solo albums. Yeah, yeah. Let's get into that. Um, okay, came out uh, towards the end of July. Yes. And it's called Strange Legends. Yes. And uh, I've I've listened to everything you've put up on YouTube. Oh, great. And it's fantastic. And uh, <clears throat> are you going to release a video for, for every... Yes, I did. You I did, did release for all yeah. of them already. I had okay. about... Yeah, I had a, almost like 10 done. But there was one more, which was the last track. And I was just waiting for a good snowstorm because the song is called Winter. Ah, and uh, it, I just put that one out very recently, you know, but I started putting them out in June. Now, I, you know, because of the pandemic, right, I decided that <clears throat> we would build a, a video studio. So all of these videos, um, I did them in my video studio, which is an outbuilding. It's closed now for the winter, but uh, but um and also, I uh, spent a lot of time working with the software, so I actually edit the stuff and edit oh, the wow. music, edit the, the video, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's it's a tremendous drain on your time, though. <laughs> I'm kind of glad all the videos are done for that album, because now I can actually go back and be the songwriter I want to be. Yeah, so, I can only imagine how much time that must take up. Uh, yeah, it takes it's 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 a doubly, you know, music I can do pretty quick, but uh, but video is is a, is twice as long to do. But the uh, the satisfaction, I mean, uh, you know, um, you know, of 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 you know, creating something from you know a song, and then you have to put make it into visuals that that makes sense. And, you know, try to yeah. look good. Hardest part is getting the right costume. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Saturday Night Live has a few laying around. Yeah, they might. They might have my old costume. <laughs> Be a little big on me now. <laughs> Walk of Fame. Walk of Walk Fame of is uh, is one of the, the songs that really stood out to me. Um, you know, it's yeah. just... Well, you know, that one... There, there was a time uh, in the summer, maybe well, maybe it was September, that that song all of a sudden shot up on all the charts. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me why. The video was done really quickly with some sort of stock footage. And, um, and it's kind of a, it's just a, a lyric video, basically a lyric video. Right. Uh, and, and since then, I've actually rewritten that song for acoustic guitar. So I may put out an acoustic version of that. Nice. But um, I love that song. Yeah. <laughs> it was It was like me. I was trying to do my best now, Rogers, on the guitar. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and also, I got to say, I really love the drummer, Mickey Curry. Who, who who played on this album. Most of my solo albums, I, the first album, I had Michael Cardelloni play drums, uh, who's a fantastic drummer. Play, he's the drummer with Leonard Skinner. So right. if, you go, if you go see Skinner, you see Michael, and he's awesome, awesome, and great to work with. But, you know, he's been very busy over the years with Skinner, you know. Right. 
And so I found out that Mickey, um, who plays with Brian Adams, and he's played with Alice Cooper and Cher and Tina Turner and tons of people. The Cult. He did the Cult's album, Sonic wow. Temple. Yeah, how good is Sonic Temple? Amazing. So, yeah. So, he, but he happens to live in the next town over. And I met his brother, who plays the flute at an open mic. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll hook you up with Mickey. And so we did two sessions, did all the tracks in, in two sessions in a local studio here. And, oh, man, I couldn't be happier. You know, he really puts the the kick in there. You know, that yeah. uh, it makes it easy for me to mix, too, because uh, more drums is always good. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, are, are you playing the bass still? Yeah, or? I, I play all the bass. Uh, most of the guitars, there's one guitar part my girlfriend plays. And uh, I do all the vocals and keyboards. And, Amazing. Uh, you know, there's a couple of harmonies my girlfriend plays, sings those too. Uh, but most most of it's me, you know, like 90, 95%. And, uh, and Mickey on the drums. Yeah. Great. I, I, I definitely do that again. Um the other albums, my other al solo albums, I use program drums, and you know they're they I can program the you know a perfect drum part, but that's the problem. It's too perfect. Yeah, and you can't you can't feel the muscle, the the connection from the stick down to this the, from here hitting the cymbal to there. There's just a sort of disconnect. Yeah, no matter how good it is, there's a disconnect, and when you have a real drummer. It's it it just grabs you, you know, yeah, deep it grabs you deep. Anyway, that's that's my production <laughs> <laughs> uh, stuff that I do. Get to where you were on the bass. Hmm. Well, um, I wasn't a bass player until I got to college. So when I started playing bass, I started thinking back to our fir our high school band. And we had, we got lucky because not only Albert was a good player and my cousin played great rhythm guitar, we had this bass player who had some magic to him. He, okay. he had a feel that was solid. I mean, it was just solid as a rock, you know. And this warm tone that he had too, big fat tone. And th I, that's one of the reasons that our high school band was so good. So we had a, just a killer bass player, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Baznat. And, you know, he was one of my best friends from high school. Wow. And he was part of, the, part of the gang, you know. So when I started playing bass, I always say, man, if I could make this feel as good as Eddie. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I've, I'd listen to everything. I used to love going to, the, like, the, uh, the ice cream shop. Or the Knights of Columbus Hall, and they had an old jukebox, and they would put the old jukebox on. The bass sounded incredible on those things. Yeah, you know what I mean. One of the, uh, those they roll that they just shake the room. It, the bass was so good. Yeah, you know, um, the bass is. Um, I think people in general, you know, there's all always jokes about the bass player getting left out in the cold, and <laughs> sure. you know, like the memes <laughs> and stuff. You know, where sure. You know, everyone always kind of rips on the bass player just because, sure. you know, but, you know, I, there's a lot of people that think the bass player is the most important, uh, you know, part of the band. And hey, Paul I tend, McCartney, I tend to he, agree. <laughs> he, uh, he knows that that emotional, you know, you, th how the bass is played can often determine how everything else sort of falls into place, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the emotional content is often started right there in the bottom of the, the, the base. So, yeah. You know, I was influenced by, you know, the Beatles and the Stones. And um, the Beach Boys used studio people like Carol Kay or... Uh, um, yeah. And I got to meet Carol Kay. Did she's you? Wow. Amazing. Yeah, she's, she was, she's an amazing, amazing player. Yeah. And... Um, but, you know, sort of the commercial, you know, uh, Joe Osborne was really good. You know, the type that played on the hit records, it, it, uh, the okay. Wrecking Crew. And, and uh, 
Then, you know, later on, I think I was really influenced a lot by Roger Glover. Oh. Of, of all the bass players in this sort of world, Roger really influenced me. He played with the pick, played really hard, you know, uh, and he is just a, a great foundation on all those um, uh, Deep Purple records. Definitely. When when we had an opportunity to work with uh, Martin Birch, who sadly just passed away a few months back, he, uh, you know, the reason we got him was because he did Machine Head and Smoke on the Water and uh, uh, like, wow, you know, and then he did, you know, a lot of great stuff. White Snake and, you know, eventually took over uh, the production of Iron Maiden. I think he did like nine records with Iron Maiden, you know, and oh, that's wow. based on the, that's, that's, that's really heavy bass stuff. Yeah. He was a bass player himself, actually. He kept saying, I should give you my bass, you know. Huh. And I said, "Now nah, I'll just use mine. That's the, that. That's the bass over there. That bass right there. That's the bass that was played on Burning for You." Is uh, I was going to actually ask you about. Is that a? Uh, that's the Music Man. The Music Man. Okay. And right next to it is my Precision bass. Okay. I, I I hadn't played that in a long time, but I just played it on a couple of demos recently, and got that out. New strings and. You know, work on the setup. Those, uh, those are my babies. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love your bass sound on "Burning for You." Um, that I, I owe that to Martin Birch. Wow, you know, amazing. When Donald demoed that one out good. It's he wrote that song, and uh, I, I thought that I, we had the lyrics at the house, and and I thought that this, the lyric was, was could, could be a hit. And then he came up with a version, but his on his demo the bass was kind of light, so Albert and myself and Martin Birch we we got this sort of twangier, you know, sound on the bass for that one. And also, uh, I, I I think I was a better player in those days than I was in the early days. You know, if you, the more records you do and the more right. tours you do, you really build up your hands. You know. Yeah, I thought Fall, falling I th apart now. <laughs> <laughs> I th but they were good. <laughs> I assure you, they were good at one time. Oh, okay. I thought you possibly may have been using a Rickenbacker on uh, "Burning no, for You," you know, just because of that little bit the of twang, a high, yeah, yeah. The, high, the little bit of a high end yeah. tone on it. No, that's the Music Man. That's awesome. And uh, we had a, I had a little joke going with. Uh, with Martin in the studio, I, I, I wanted a little more. I wanted a little less top and a little more bottom, right? You know? <laughs> Trying to sound like Eddie. And right. if I touched the top end and moved it just the tiniest little bit, he knew he could hear it. Oh. He says, "Put it back! Come on, put it back!" <laughs> and I put it back, and he was happy. That yeah, working with we worked with Martin on two albums, and all the producers we worked with, uh, you know, certainly shape who I am today, you know, and how I produce my records. Right. Um, you know, I I often think, uh, you know, if I'm singing the song and there's nobody else around, I'm doing this by myself most of the time. Uh, you know, I think. Well, what would Martin say? <laughs> what Don't would touch Martin that say? Now. Is he go, is he going to tell me stop, or is he going to say no? You can do it better, you know. Right. So you you you're working by yourself a lot, and you know, luckily it's, it costs less than it used to. I mean, True. those records were pretty expensive back in the day, but you know, with modern technology and a few a few basic toys nothing nothing too fancy here um you can produce a, a really well you heard it yeah you know my sixth solo album strange legends great it's album. available at all your retail outlets and you can come to my website which is joebouchard.com and uh 
and uh, it, it did really well this year. You know, I'm just and it's it's helping sell all the other records too. So um, people are just it's a good year for the Bouchard brothers. My brother put out a solo album that did really well. <clears throat> okay, is I that... got to play trumpet on that. Go ahead and tell us about that, too. Okay, um, so do, Albert brothers and I, are... we, we've been working together since 1962, you know? <laughs> right. We've been, we've been working together since 1962. So he says, hey, I want you to play something on the Ima Reimagine Us project. And I'm thinking about it, saying, hmm, and I've got these, I've been practicing my trumpet because I, I don't know why. I, I think I'm just obsessed with brass instruments. Okay. There are a couple over there. I got a flugelhorn. I got two cornets. I got a, yeah. And so I said, hmm, how about a trumpet solo? So he mm -hmm. sent me a couple of tracks. I said, see what you can do on this. Just do anything you want. And I knew that if he didn't like it, he would just erase it. You know, it's not hard to do. Right. So, um, but he said, can you do something like, there's a, a band called Love, Arthur Lee and Love. They were a, a group from the early 70s on Electra. Tremendous yeah. uh, album. And they have like a lot of like orchestrations and trumpet. There's trumpet on it, you know. Okay. So he said, can you do something like Love? And I said, sure, you know. So I, I worked on that. And uh, then I did another one, which is uh, the uh, song called Imaginos. And that has a little trumpet in it, and then it, then it goes to a like, you know, five trumpet parts and gets really orchestrated at the end. Wow! So, um, and he's putting out another version of this uh, on vinyl. He's doing a a double vinyl set that will be out this spring, uh, and it has the uh, Imaginos Overture. And I played trumpet on, you know, five different places in the overture. So oh, that wow. was a lot of fun. Can't yeah. You... It just uh, it said, he just said, do it. And I said, well, okay, I'll see what I can find, you know. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah. You know, try some different things. and Yeah, you have to hit me up when that when it comes out. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, I'll do, yeah. do some plugging for you. Yeah. So my brother and I, we started our own record label this year. Okay. Our own custom label called Rock Heart Records. Okay. And we plan to do even more projects in 2021. And uh, at we with the we were going to put one out early in the spring, but I think because of the vinyl, it'll probably be later in the summer. You know? Okay. We we started a live uh, project, live with video. And uh, so about half of it's recorded already. And uh, we're just planning to do, you know, even more uh, more tracks and, you know, fill it out and make it a, like a real project. And that'll be out maybe in the middle of the next year. And then uh, maybe another solo album here or we don't know. There's a... <laughs> right. Hey. But it, 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 this year was so good. We got to keep going, you know. It was just so good. Yeah, you know, everyone is, uh, you know, everything's up in the air still. No one has yeah. any any solid plans. So, well, it's... we we certainly we certainly have time to to work on things in the uh, in the home studios. Right. Um, I miss gigs a lot. <clears throat> yeah. You play gigs? Yeah. Well. I used to. Yeah, yeah. I used <laughs> yeah. to too. Yeah, I, I really miss it, man. Really. Oh man, it's it's terrible. Uh, yeah, and it's gonna be a while. This is the tough tough part, you know, because everybody just likes to jam in together and they're they're sweating and they're singing at the top of their lungs, you know. Yep, yep. Not social distancing at all. Yeah, yeah concerts that. concerts are so weird now when they actually do have people and they're yeah. all six feet six, apart. And, yeah. And but hey, you know, you got to do what you got to do, right? You know, and the applause is people flashing their whole, the lights. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you, you take what you can get, I guess, yeah. right? Actually, I've been doing a lot of uh, Zoom uh, 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 
performances. Oh, another I, good I, way. Every every week, I've I've done over fifty songs. I'm. This is part of the thing where I've, I'll try to figure out. Well, if we do this live thing next year, what are the songs that we should do? So I've been trying them out on Zoom. Now yeah. Zoom is not the greatest music platform, you know. Right. It the music does not sound as good as it should, and uh, so but. I've learned a lot about songs and I've discovered some new things, some new songs. And I do this, you know, once a week, maybe twice a week, once a week. And our fa we had a family Zoom the other day. It was fantastic. Great. You know, for Christmas. We did one at Thanksgiving. Yeah. Now, we, now it was so good that we want to do one every month. <laughs> right. No, that My family and I have actually been doing that. Um, yeah, we do. We, that. we try to do it like once a week, but it, it turns out usually like once a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. it's. I'm con I'm more connected with my family than than I used to be. Really, you'd yeah. see them at a wedding, maybe you know. Yeah. Or you know, once in a while, but uh, now we we have a regular thing where we do it every Saturday. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. 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 All right, everyone. Well, JoeBouchard.com. I'm gonna leave that description in the link. Um, on all platforms and as always please subscribe um, no matter where you're listening to this at it's really a big help for the show and it allows us to keep getting awesome guests like joe here so well, thank you thank you so much scott thanks so much joe let's, uh, let's talk again sometime oh, send any... me a link to the program i'd love to love to check it out great i'll i'll right. do that oh all right happy new year Happy New Year to you. <laughs> Have and, a good uh, one. Thank I'm you so. Try. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, man. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye.